your seats. Um, for those of you who have not met before, I am Matthew Hart. I am the CEO of Longwoods Publishing, and uh, this is our last breakfast for the Chiefs before the holidays, and we're really looking forward to it. Um, a, a couple quick housekeeping notes for the Q&A. Uh, for those of you who have not been here before, you'll notice that you have a mic in front of you. Uh, you can push the button, and if the button is a solid red, you have the floor. If the button is flashing or the red light is flashing, you are in the queue. Uh, I do ask that you turn it off when you're done so that the next person uh, gets to take over. Um, so for sponsoring today or supporting today, uh, Breakfast with the Chiefs again is not possible without the support of our sponsors. So today is the, uh, supporting us is the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvements, uh, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, Medtronic Canada, and then of course our facility is uh, provided by Sick Kids. So a uh, big thank you to them. So not too long ago, uh, Longwoods and uh, some of our staff we uh, ran across a video on the Toronto Star um, about uh, let's get this right the Redstone Dementia Unit in Peel. And uh, after watching that video, the group of us thought, wow, this would be uh, fantastic uh, to learn about and uh, more on dementia and that sort of idea as well. And so we decided to uh, invite Dr. Saha, and he uh, graciously uh, accepted our invitation. And uh, so we are um, pleased to welcome to the floor Dr. Saha. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So thank you, Matt, for that introduction. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking to you today about dementia in general to start off with. We'll start off with some uh, statistics, subsequent to which we'll progress into a slightly more kind of detailed discussion about dementia, and subsequently uh, we will discuss some cases, and that will highlight to you the challenges that we face in the context of where we are and where I certainly think we should be going. Okay, so. Due to advances in healthcare and public health efforts in general, the segment of the elderly population is growing. People are living longer. And as the population of the world grows, the segment of the elderly population is growing faster than any other age segment. So at this point in time, from a prevalent statistic, if you were to look at the global, health pop, uh, global population, the percentage of people who would be above the age of 65, and that would be traditionally considered to be seniors, is about 13%. And if you were to make projections into the future, that percentage is expected to rise to about 20% by the year 2030. However, I was more alarmed to note that by current projections, for the first time in the recorded history of the world, by the year 2045, the number of people who are older than the age of 65 will be larger than the number of children below the age of 15. This is where the world is going in the context of population demographics. And I keep referencing the perspective of the age of 65, and the importance for that is that 65 is actually the year where the statistics in terms of the validated published literature suggests that for every five years that you live beyond the age of 65, you double your risk of getting dementia. And what this means is that if you were to do the arithmetic on this, that by the age of 90, two out of three people will have issues related to cognitive impairment. 66% of people, the vast majority, if they are lucky enough to live to the age of 90, will have issues related to underlying cognitive impairment. So when you put the backdrop of the statistics that I've just quoted to you in terms of where the population demographic of the world is going, and you marry that with the statistics related to the prevalence of dementia, now you can begin to see why it is important that we need to get this paradigm correct. Do you see where I'm coming from? Um, people who have a formal diagnosis of dementia are four times more likely to die 
as compared to people who do not have a diagnosis of dementia. In Canada, and let's talk about some Canadian statistics, nine seniors are diagnosed with dementia every hour. Now, I'm not talking about a transient curable condition here. You need to take that in perspective. Dementia is a progressive, multisystemic, neurodegenerative illness for which there is no cure. This will ultimately prove fatal for you. The average lifespan from the context of initial diagnosis to terminal stage would be between eight to 10 years for Alzheimer's dementia. And I quote Alzheimer's dementia because it is the commonest form of dementia. Nine seniors are diagnosed with dementia every hour in Canada, okay? <coughs> Going forward from that, in terms of some Canadian prevalence statistics, as per um, statistics published by CIHI, the prevalence rise in dementia is expected to be about 21% over the course of the next 10 years. There was some recent data from Cancer Care Ontario that suggested from the perspective of Ontario, there will be a 70% rise in the prevalence of dementia of people living in the community. I want to stress this as an important point at this stage of the discussion, and I say this because Canada is a vibrant multicultural society. And from that perspective, in the context of my clinical practice, what I've noticed that there are a variety of cultures that actually erroneously extrapolate memory changes as you get older to be within the boundaries of, normal, of normality. So you say he's old and that's why he has these memory changes. And I want to stipulate that dementia is not a part of normal aging. That's important for you to know. I wanted to talk about Central West, Central West Lynn statistics because that's where I work and that's where I come from. And I was really alarmed to note that in the context of the statistics that were revealed from Cancer Care Ontario, between the years of 2015 to 2020, the Central West Lynn has the distinction of having the highest prevalence rise in dementia of a staggering 46%. 46%. The average provincial rise is about 22%. This, I, I find the statistics to be mind-boggling, to tell you the truth. And, and you know, you have to understand is that in the context of acute medicine, we see that statistic come and find us on a daily basis. And you'll see that, that, that there are some tragedies associated with that we will discuss as we go forward. There was some interesting data published related to people with dementia and hospitalization of their experience with hospitals. And I wanted to quote that to you as well today. So people who have a formal diagnosis of dementia are known to wait two and a half hours longer in ER as compared to people who don't have dementia. They have a 65% higher chance of being hospitalized as compared to people who don't have dementia. While in hospital, their length of stay is generally two times longer than a similar individual who doesn't have dementia. More importantly, their chances of developing hospital-associated harm is one and a half times higher than it is for people who don't have dementia. And I'm kind of building the case for the, of the fact that hospital is a very unfavorable place for somebody who has underlying issues related to cognitive impairment. And, that, and we need to make this very clear in terms of the healthcare system. <coughs> I'm going to go into what is referred to as, a, this is the formal definition of dementia, and I'll, I'll explain it to you in more layman's terms in a minute, but if for the sake of the record, dementia is not a specific disease. It is an overall term that describes a group of symptoms associated with a decline in memory or other cognitive skills severe enough to reduce a person's ability to perform everyday activities. That's just a definition. At the same time, I'd say to you that 60 to 80% of patients who have underlying dementia have Alzheimer's dementia. We'll come back to the slide in a minute, but as I was hinting to in the beginning of my talk, 
there are a variety of people as well as cultures that extrapolate that memory changes that happen as someone gets older would be considered to be within the gambit of normal aging. And that is an erroneous statement. Memory changes do happen as you get older, and I'll explain that to you in a minute. And then there are memory changes which would be considered to be pathological and would ultimately fulfill criteria for a diagnosis of dementia, and we'll talk about that in a minute. As you get older, I would expect that you will get more forgetful. And when I say you'd get more forgetful, it will take you longer to remember things that previously you were able to remember a lot more quickly. As you get older, your attention span will decrease. So you will say that I used to be able to kind of, you know, keep myself focused for much longer than I'm being able to do so now. As you get older, your ability to multitask will also decrease. So you can't do so many things or juggle so many balls together at the same time. And these changes, whether it's related to attention span, multitasking, or generally in terms of uh, you know, being able to remember things quickly, would be considered to be within the boundary of what would be considered to be normal changes in memory with aging. That's acceptable. However, if you, during the course of you getting older and older, you are now no longer able to perform things involving activities of daily living that you were previously able to perform, then you have a problem. Let me give you an example. If you were able to pay your household bills on time and accurately previously, but now feel that you either miss the date or you underpay or you overpay because you have memory issues or procedural memory issues, there's a problem. If you were previously able to administer medication to yourself you know, safely on time in the dosage prescribed, but now find that you frequently forget to take medication on time or don't remember to take it, that's a problem. If previously you were able to navigate a vehicle and drive a vehicle accurately, but now feel that you're struggling with the same, then that's a problem. Similarly, if you find that you are having gaps in the context of your calendar where you have made appointments to meet people but are now no longer able to do so because you forgot, etc., that is a problem. And these are activities of daily living which all of us do at an inherent level, but as you progressively get older and if you were to find that you were having deficiencies in being able to do these things, that is not within the boundaries of what would be considered to be normal changes with aging as you get older. That's pathology. That would suggest that you are likely developing a neurocognitive disorder. So let's go back and perhaps now you will be able to understand the diagnosis or the definition of dementia. So it's not a specific disease, but it is an overall term that describes a group of symptoms associated with a decline in memory or other cognitive skill severe enough to reduce a person's ability to perform everyday activities. That is the definition of dementia. <clears throat> now, it's, it's probably easier for me to explain the context of some of the stories that we will highlight later on in the talk if you understood what happens in dementia and why we see what we see. And as I've highlighted to you already, the commonest form of dementia is Alzheimer's and that's what we'll talk about. When somebody gets Alzheimer's dementia, theoretically the pathology of what is happening is that there is abnormal deposition of two types of protein, one is amyloid and the other is tau, in different parts of your brain. And these aggregates of these proteins take the form of what is referred to as neurofibrillary tangles and plaques. In terms of an oversimplification, when this protein deposition reaches a certain quantity, it actually proves toxic for the neuron around the area where it is deposited. And as it proves toxic for the neuron, the neuron dies. And when the neuron dies, two things happen. The function that that neuron was performing is now no longer able to be done as efficiently, and subsequently we see the clinical symptoms that we see subsequently, which forms what is referred to as the symptoms of dementia. 
And as the neurons die, there is a relative cerebral atrophy. So the brain shrinks in size, and you can see that on brain imaging. Okay? That's the hallmark, or in a very broad-based terms, of the pathology of what is happening. We also know that as you advance in the progression of your Alzheimer's dementia, there is also <clears throat> changes in the context of some substances in your brain, which is referred to as neurotransmitters, and these facilitate communication between your neurons. And the three neurotransmitters that are predominantly involved when you develop Alzheimer's is acetylcholine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. And I think that's getting a bit technical, but this, the point I'm trying to highlight is that the protein deposition leads to toxicity of neurons which kills the neurons and there is also a relative deficiency of some neurotransmitters which make transmission within the brain to be compromised so the brain is unable to act as efficiently as it does in a normal individual okay <coughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to dwell on the technical bit for a bit longer because I do think that it will really help you in the context of understanding what happens and why people behave or act the way they do. And again, I would also reference the fact that if the statistics are what the statistics are, and we are saying that there is a 66% chance that if you were to live to the age of 90, that you, are develop, you will develop issues related to cognitive impairment, I would extrapolate that to say that each one of you in the audience today has either been directly involved with somebody who has had dementia or indirectly knows a relative who has dementia. That is the prevalence of this disease. And from that perspective, what I would encourage you to do that as I explain to you as regards to the development of the symptoms, I would say go back to that person that you interacted with and, try and, and you'll see parts of the puzzle fit together for you. Now, I've referenced to you that there is abnormal deposition of protein in certain parts of the brain, subsequent to which there is an increased level of toxicity and the neurons die. The pattern of the deposition of the protein happens in a slightly predictable sequence, and that is why the progression of the disease is, in some sense, quite predictable. Now, I'm going to start off with the hippocampus, and the hippocampus, if I may you know, use the lib term liberally, it is like the memory capital of your brain. And the hippocampus, I would refer to it as a sort of a memory librarian. So what the hippocampus does is that as I'm giving you this talk right now, it is my hippocampus that is registering this memory. And once it registers the memory, it files it into your cerebral cortex, which is your brain, and thereby the memory lives. So in the future, if I need to access this memory, the hippocampus will go to my cortex and basically take out that memory and I will be able to re-access re it or relive it and remember, okay? That is the function of the hippocampus and that is the important place where you register your memories. It is important to mention this fact because in Alzheimer's, the central construct of where protein deposition starts off with is in the hippocampus. So as the protein deposition starts in the hippocampus and the neurons there die, the hippocampus malfunctions. And when the hippocampus malfunctions, people are unable to register new memories. So their short-term memory gets significantly compromised. Not only are they not able to register new memories, they are unable to file those memories for access later on. So the corollary to that is, that people will start asking the same question again and again and again. So it's like, I just told you the answer to that question, why are you asking me that again? And it can be quite exasperating to people around, but it's like you tell them something and they just can't seem to register that information. And that's why this is happening. As the disease spreads, it also involves your temporal lobes. And the temporal lobes are the two parts of your brain which are just in front of your ears on the sides, right? And when the, if you are a left-handed person and your right temporal lobes get affected, this is the part of your brain that is related to issues related to language. <clears throat> So what will happen is that the patient will, or the patient's family will come to you with complaints related to the fact that my father used to be a very eloquent person, but now I find that his vocabulary is very limited, or he speaks in non-specifics. 
they will reference statements like he will say, we will go there then. Where will you go and when will you go there? It lacks specificity. Okay, so these are the kind of, these are in the initial stages and these will be the subtle signs that you will pick up. You will also notice that there will be a tendency for people in a multicultural society like this to regress to their native language. So, they, you know, they probably come to Canada, they subsequently learn how to speak English and as the, uh, you know, the involvement of the temporal lobes progresses, because the English came on later compared to their primary language, they lose the English first before they lose their primary language. If the temporal lobes on the right side of your brain is involved, what happens is that you lose the ability to recognize familiar places and familiar faces. And the captivating part of that is that usually, again, it happens in a chronological sequence. So grandparents will first struggle to recognize grandchildren because they are the latest addition to the context of the family. Subsequent to which, they will start to lose the ability to recognize children, then perhaps their partner, then perhaps their siblings in a retrograde manner in that sense. You will also see that with their loss of ability to recognize a familiar place, a lot of these people will say, I would like to go home. And when their family tells them, well, you are at home, they'll say, no, 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 I want to go home. And if you explore that comment, you will, say that you will see that their home has now become an unfamiliar place to them. And when they are talking about home, they wish to return to the home where they spent their childhood or where they lived with their parents because that is the part of the memory that they can now still access, whereas their recent memory has gotten compromised. And that is the sequence of events as it happens. The frontal lobes are quite large parts of your brain, and they are referred to, and this is the front of your brain over here, and they, they are referred to as the executive or the management center of your brain. And it is instrumental, the top part in particular is instrumental in you multitasking. So if, if and, and again, this starts to affect activities related to daily living, and I'll explain to you how. Even the simple task of making a cup of tea involves a lot of prerequisites. You need to put the water in the kettle, you need to put the kettle on, you need to take the cup out of the cupboard, you need to put the tea bag in the cup, you need to remember how many you know, teaspoons of sugar you take. It all needs to happen in a certain sequence that your brain needs to be able to process. When the top part of your frontal lobe starts getting affected, your ability to sequence and multitask gets compromised and he will become very clumsy and people will not be able to understand why somebody who was otherwise quite astute now has become so clumsy. If the middle part of your frontal lobe is concerned, and this is related to mood, what will happen is that people will become very apathetic. So somebody who was otherwise the life of the party or a very socializing person will now no longer want to go and socialize with friends. They would rather stay at home, not talk very much, become rather apathetic. <clears throat> if the lower part of your frontal lobes are involved, this is a part of your brain that, <clears throat> that keeps you socially appropriate. And by that, what I mean is that changes to the frontal lobes with protein deposition will result in what is largely referred to as socially inappropriate behavior. But socially inappropriate behavior can take a lot of meanings, and largely it is in the subtleties. So patients will come to you, or families will come to you and say, my mother used to be so prim and proper, but now she uses profanities all the time. Or they'll come to you and say, my father used to be the kindest and sweetest man in the world, and now he loses his temper at the drop of a hat. I don't know what's going on. It's like it's a different person. It's because the frontal lobe at that part of your brain has started to get affected. <coughs> the parietal lobes are two big lobes at the back on, over here of your brain. And if the parietal lobe on the left side gets affected, what happens is that your ability to process reading 
or process numbers gets compromised. So you'll find that people who are voracious readers throughout their life no longer want to read. And it's just very unlike my father not to read anymore. He would love to read the newspaper, but he doesn't. And it's because even when he reads, he can no longer process that information. So there's no interest there anymore. Or he, you will come up with the fact that you know, he used to be so on the ball with numbers. I mean, you'd go shopping with him and you'd have all the sums done up in terms of how much we owed. He can't do that anymore. More importantly, if this part of your brain is involved, you lose the ability to discriminate left from right. And the problem with that is that when you cannot make out what is left and what is right, your ability to dress yourself, for example, or eat properly starts to get compromised. And you develop something called apraxia. <clears throat> If the right side of your parietal lobes is involved, what happens is that your ability to judge depth or three dimension changes. So because of that, you know, they might not be able to go and pick up a glass of water as accurately as they did, or they will fall more often because they misjudge the environment. So these are kind of in broad brushes, some of the, uh, these are the key sequence of events of how protein deposition happens and why you start to see the symptoms in dementia that you see. I've saved the amygdala for last because the amygdala is a part of your brain um, that is part of the limbic system, and that is your emotional brain. And the remarkable thing is that your amygdala is actually in very close physical proximity to the hippocampus, which was the first part that we referenced that is clearly involved with Alzheimer's. But the surprise is that the amygdala, which is the emotional capital of your brain, does not get affected in Alzheimer's until much later in the course of the disease. And I make that point to segue into the definition that dementia individuals are not thinking individuals, they are feeling individuals. And what I'm trying to highlight there is that through the sequence of events of those lobes getting affected as I've described to you, you then have the unique circumstances of the individual who no longer has confidence in his brain being able to do what it was used to do previously, but can still feel that inadequacy, which subsequently leads to significant amounts of anxiety, tension, irritability, and, and a lack of confidence. And that's what drives some of the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia that we see. <clears throat> so now that I have described to you the sequence of events of what happens to a person's brain with dementia, I'm going to take you through two case histories in this context, and you'll be able to put things in a bit more perspective. The case histories have been slightly changed to maintain patient confidentiality, which I'm sure you can understand. The first case is that of an 82-year-old Portuguese gentleman. My inference was that this guy had changes related to memory or had had a formal, I mean, had changes in keeping with dementia for a few years before he presented. But the family had extrapolated his memory changes to be within the gambit of normal aging and had kind of refused to acknowledge it. And as his dementia had progressed, looking after him had become more and more challenging. And this was not easy for his wife, who was of a similar chronological vintage. Things reached ahead when one day, with the progression of his dementia, he raised his hand to hit his wife. And this was the straw that broke the camel's back. And the patient with his family came to ER saying, enough is enough. There is no way my mother is gonna to continue to do this. She has been toiling away after my father for years and this is the way he repays her. We're not doing it. So although he was 82, he's built like a tank like really physically very robust. And from that side of things, things were really, really good. But from a cognitive side of things, his cognitive impairment had now progressed to a stage he was that he was even unable to recognize his own children. So this would mean that he's in the advanced stages of the disease. <clears throat> when he was brought to the ER, 
initial medical assessment in the form of brain imaging and blood tests demonstrated there was nothing acute going on. And that's entirely what I would expect. So for this individual, his diagnosis is advanced stage neurocognitive disorder or Alzheimer's dementia. There's nothing acute going on that requires him to be in a hospital environment. There is no magic pill that you can give him that will suddenly magically make all of this go away. Memory terrain once lost cannot be recovered. But the circumstances of his presentation, I mean, I think the diagnosis clearly helps, but there was nothing acute going on that hospitals or what they're kitted out for could do here. But the presentation and the complaints of the family was, there is no way we can continue to look after this individual anymore. We're not taking him home. And under those circumstances, he was in eMERGE. Now, let's put this through now, the, the viewpoint of the person who has the dementia. So for an individual who can now no longer recognize his own children, finds himself in an emergency environment with lots of noises and beeps and all that going on, nobody familiar, he cannot grasp onto anything to orientate himself in the, the context of what is happening. We've seen that he has, he's quite an inflexible natured man, which led to some of the altercation he had with his wife. Unsurprisingly, he has an altercation with the nurse who was looking after him because it's an you know, anxiety provoking atmosphere. And the next thing you know, he has five security guards pinning him down to the bed and he is given antipsychotic medication as a chemical restraint. If you have dementia and you are giving psychoactive medication like antipsychotics, it will not be good for your cognition. I mean, I suspect that the validity of the prescription under the circumstances can be argued to be logical. I mean, he was being violent in a, in a hospital emergency environment. It happens all the time. Subsequent to this, he was put in four-point restraints because he was both being agitated and aggressive and there was a tendency for exit seeking because all he could say is, I want to go home he probably would struggle to recognize his own home, but it's a latent reflex all of us would have in terms of, I want to go home because that's where you'd find comfort. Subsequent to this, he was transferred to the ward because the family were disinclined to take him home. I had assessed him at that point in time and had made a formal diagnosis related to dementia. He was clearly demonstrating what is referred to as behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, and this is to some extent amenable to some pharmacological intervention that is not going to be curative, but will kind of polish off the edges to make it slightly more manageable, so that you know, providing the care for him can be a bit more salvageable from a family perspective. But the family by this time had decided there is no way we're going to continue to look after this individual at home. He has to go to long-term care from hospital. The average wait time to go to long-term care from hospital where I live is about 18 to 24 months. So I don't know how feasible that is, but I mean, that was the desire of the family. So we're now reaching about day three or day four. And in this period of time, what has happened is that, as I told you before, he's built like a tank. All that we can get is he had regressed to speaking in his native Portuguese. So communicating with the staff on the ward was again very difficult. But we know for a fact from what the family told us that the thing he kept verbalizing again and again and again was that he just wanted to go home. But that was not possible. And this also nuanced onto some concerns related to the fact that he was exit seeking. There was some restlessness queries. There were some options related to agitation, which is why he was kept in restraints. As he was physically quite robust, on one instance, within the first few days of his admission, he had managed to try and partly disentangle himself from the restraints of his chair and wasn't entirely able to, you know, kind of rationalize what had happened and tried to get up to leave, and in that process fell spectacularly forward and hit his head with the chair landing on top of him. Fortunately for him, he didn't get a subdural hematoma, but he did suffer from a concussion injury, and subsequent to the concussion injury, he developed what is referred to as delirium. Delirium is an acute confusional state. It is a reflection of diminished cognitive reserve, and it is very common in people who have dementia. 
and people who are in hospital with dementia have a very low threshold for jumping into delirium. By day three, he is now quite delirious, and the delirium, or well, the agitated delirium, is making his restlessness worse, which progresses onto the perspective of putting him in further restraints. When you put him in further restraints, you decondition him. At the same time, I think because of the language communication issue, I think he was unable to uh, communicate when he needed to go to the washroom, likely became constipated, and a bladder scan, so when you get constipated, your, fecal, your rectal loading will cause bladder spasm and will cause you to go into urinary retention. A bladder scan was done. He was found to have a large urine residual volume. And the next thing you have it is that a Foley's catheter has been inserted. For an individual who has cognitive impairment to a stature that he is now no longer able to recognize his daughter, for him to have the cognitive ability to understand why there is suddenly a rubber tube that is extremely uncomfortable that is going up his penis, is going to be difficult to rationalize. And if anything, will lead to further agitated behaviors and unhappiness. Under these circumstances, most patients will pull their catheter and cause significant urethral trauma. So you get the gist of how things are progressing. At this point in time, I had kind of actually rotated out of the consultation service, but this progresses in a situation of you know, being kept under both physical as well as chemical restraints, him deconditioning, although continuously expressing a desire to want to go home. At the end of six weeks, he was found to be unresponsive. A code blue was called. He was resuscitated. He was transferred to intensive care where resuscitation efforts failed. He passed away. This is an individual who till six weeks ago was living with his wife, albeit with dementia, but with no acute medical illness. He was brought to hospital because of some behaviors where the diagnosis was there's nothing acutely wrong with him. But the paradigm of care was such that in my opinion, contributed in a significant manner to this individual's demise. This happens in acute care every day. It's happening now as we speak. Every hospital, whether you talk about downtown Toronto or provincially, community or otherwise, sees this on a nearly everyday basis. This is the problem. If I'm, and as I've told you at the beginning of the talk, if the prevalence statistics are what the prevalence statistics are, and if this is the mandate or the paradigm of care in the acute sector, which is the case, we have a problem. We have a big problem. And that is what we need to concentrate on in the context of changing. In that, path, in, in that process, let me go on to another case for you. So I'm now going to reference the context of the butterfly model. And the butterfly model's central theme and I would say accurately, as was exemplified in the first case that I spoke to you about, is that dementia individuals are not thinking beings, they are feeling beings. And as you can see in the particular case, he wasn't really thinking straight, but as you, there was a lot of evidence to suggest he was feeling the anxiety, he was feeling you know, the, the sense of restlessness that you were seeing being in an unfamiliar or uncontrolled environment. Now let me take you through another case. This was an 84-year-old man of Indian descent. He had come to Canada approximately 20 years ago because his son who had come here, he and his wife, um, the son and his wife were struggling to look after his, their two daughters because they were both working and they were finding it difficult in that sense. And it was under these grounds that they requested his father to come to Canada and that was the grounds in which he immigrated. He had lived in Canada for 20 years and had been instrumental in raising his two granddaughters. And you could see that even in the time I met him in that significant fondness that he had for his two granddaughters. As he had gotten older, he had developed dementia. 
in the context of the care assessment for dementia, it was required that he would require 24-hour supervision, which the family were unable to provide because they were working, and this facilitated his movement to long-term care, and he was at Malton Village. When I first saw this gentleman, the clinical nuance that was brought forward to me was that he is an extremely affectionate man, otherwise very kind-hearted, and would hug people all the time because that was in the context of the cultural congruity which he came from. But the staff were facing significant issues related to the fact that he was described to be very violent when anybody would try to do kind of toileting care or intimate care with him. And I was consulted in the context of the fact that, can we give this gentleman something that's gonna make this go away? But hold on a minute, let's analyze this from what's really going on. So first of all, we have, we acknowledge the fact that dementia individuals are not thinking individuals, they are feeling individuals. If you were to, to, to assess this gentleman from cultural congruity perspective, Having a situation of a youngish woman, and let's me put it to you this way, it's a different woman every day that comes in to provide intimate toileting care for him, this would, for a gentleman of his background, be a very uncomfortable situation. So the fact that he responds in that manner is not entirely surprising. So when they analyzed this from the butterfly paradigm, what they discovered was that it was a question of setting up a trust situation. So they allocated a male carer for him who would spend a significant amount of time so to establish a trust relationship. The, I mean, and, and you know, as these people grew in the context of the, the butterfly model, and I'll go into that in a bit more in, 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 a, in a second, is that what he found was that in the morning, before he was going to go and do any toileting care, because his sense of personal hygiene had deteriorated with him developing dementia, that he would go and give the gentleman a hug in keeping with what was a, a behavioral paradigm for him. And that by kind of just reinforced that trust relationship, and then he would go and toilet the individual, and there was never a problem. So effectively asking for pharmacological intervention to get rid of what is, I would refer to as a volitional reflex of discomfort when a young woman who he does not know suddenly goes in and tries to do toileting on him, he's acting because that's the way he wants to act. There's nothing pathological there, it's volitional. And that is the part that people start to forget in the context of dementia. I've highlighted to you that people who have dementia, I think the commonest problem from an emotional or a feeling perspective that they suffer from is higher levels of anxiety. And that higher level of anxiety comes from a variety of different places. One is the fact that I don't think they can trust their own brains. I mean, I've heard comments to suggest that I don't know why I said that or why that came out of my mouth, but it did, right? And, and you know, when you feel you have no confidence in your own brain, I mean, what, you're going to feel quite anxious. And, and, and you know, again, that's some of the kind of theory behind what's driving the behaviors. But what I would reference to you, and I think this is, I would agree with the butterfly model on this, that if people are going to live in long-term care, and a substantial number of these people are, it makes sense to take away the institutionalized feel of a long-term care facility because that will, if anything, increase levels of anxiety for these individuals, which, which is completely understandable. Who would want to live in an institutionalized setting? These people haven't done anything wrong that they need to live in an institution. This is what their new home is. So that new home needs to be as much home-like as it can be. And it facilitates an environment which is non-institutionalized and more home-like. So the carers don't wear uniforms. They dress in normal clothes. And it actually, I found that this was actually very, very intelligent of them. <clears throat> so they will incorporate things like having, uh, you know, everyday things of life being around so that it feels like a much more homely atmosphere. What they've also kind of stumbled upon is the fact that, you know, it doesn't matter what your level of education is or what your educational background is or what your cultural background is. Everybody, no matter where you come from, will be very familiar in the context of you know, eating a meal. 
And what they do is that they make the meals to be the central theme of the day on which they form the construct. So it doesn't matter where you come from, but all of you will be familiar with the, with the duties of laying a table, laying the plates, putting out the cutlery, maybe a nice tablecloth, etc., sitting down to have a meal, serving the food, and subsequently clearing the table, which is task orientated but it makes the person feel useful. And also, these skills have been done for such a long time that it's kind of an innate, I mean, it's deeply ingrained in your cerebral cortex. So you really need to be in a fairly advanced stages of dementia for you to be that functionally compromised that you cannot collaborate with these aspects. So what they do is that they make the meals to be the central theme of the day. So they're concentrating on a home-like setting, nice tablecloth, comfortable chairs, colored plates, nice cutlery, etc., and you know, get the individual involved in that context to make lunch or dinner a very social or central theme of the day. And this results in people coming out of their shell, feeling useful, interacting more, resulting in much better outcomes from what I can see, and eating better at the same time. I mean, you, you compare that to other circumstances that I have seen in long-term care that would involve unfortunate examples in which an individual who has dementia, but because there's a label of the fact that he has displayed behaviors, is sat down to dinner, but is not given a knife because he cannot be trusted with a knife because he has behaviors, he could be violent. My question to you is this, if you have cognitive impairment that is of such a progressive nature that you may actually struggle to recognize close family or struggle to recognize food on the table, how do you expect that individual to eat his meal without a knife? How do you expect him to have the cognitive ability? I mean, I would struggle with a piece of meat without a knife, forget him. And then if he gets frustrated that he can't eat his meal and he bangs the table because he cannot communicate, he is labeled to have more behaviors. This is the paradigm that we are currently in. 60% of people in the region of peer long-term care facilities have a formal diagnosis of dementia. If you were to evaluate all of them, the projection is that actually more than 80% of them would fulfill criteria for a diagnosis of underlying major neurocognitive disorder, 80%. And this is the paradigm of care that is the default paradigm in long-term care in general. When you look at the prevalent statistics that I've quoted to you, you can now begin to understand in terms of how unprepared we are in the context of what is the requirement at the table and what is the paradigm of care that we are currently providing at the table. And this results in adverse outcomes for everybody. And I'll tell you, I would encourage you to take this seriously and take this personally, because if the prevalent statistics are what they are, this will come and find you all, either directly or indirectly. So if you choose to make a change, it's for all of us and for yourself as well. Again, one of the things that I had noticed in the context, and it is really quite remarkable to see this, is that the staff who now work on the Butterfly Ward don't really want to work anywhere else. So when they go to another ward and they see that the paradigm of care is what it used to be or what it currently is for that ward, they find it to be horrific. Do you see where I'm coming from? And they don't really want to work there at all. I'm at 8.45, so I'm gonna stop there and just open, open up to any questions that you may have. I hope you found that useful. So uh, we do have some time for uh, a few questions. Uh, so again, uh, push the button in front of, uh, in front of you and uh, then we'll go from there. So do we have any questions? Feel free to raise your hand and let us know that you are there. So you gave the example of some of the um, paradigm of care in the hospital setting and in the long-term care and some ways that it could be changed. What about in the community care or people still living in the community? What are some models there that maybe are, are not helpful and that could be all helpful? 
Well, I mean, I, you know, I think I think the whole system needs to change because if the prevalent statistics are what the president, they, they will seventy percent of people in an acute hospital are actually elderly people over sixty-five. Any, I mean, I say this from Brampton Civic's perspective or Etobicoke General. Seventy percent of the people that are admitted in that building are over sixty-five, right? And I've quoted the statistics to you already. So whether you're talking about the acute care sector, whether you're talking about the long-term care sector, and and I quoted to you that there's a seventy percent prevalence increase in community dwelling individuals who fulfill criteria for a diagnosis of dementia. So this is, uh, you know, it, 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 every segment will need to change in the context of how we deliver care to facilitate the understanding that normal conventional care as it is currently being delivered is unfit for purpose. It will have to incorporate the fact that a different approach needs to be had with these people. You gain trust or you are able to enter their cognitive currency through an emotional pathway rather than an institutionalized, regimen-orientated pathway. That's the point. Oh, okay. Um, so in the Netherlands, they have this place called Hogowick. I'm not... The Dementia Village. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think Canada would ever um, develop something like that? I, I think that, you know, I mean, I haven't visit, uh, visited the Dementia Village yet, but the context of, their, of, of what I, my understanding is that they, um, they facilitate an environment where people with dementia continue to live with other people who are much younger, who are facilitated to live there with the understanding that they will support that society and thereby keep seniors more engaged and more cognitively functional and give them a better life. But I mean, I think the relevance of that is to a certain stage of the dementia trajectory. When you reach the advanced stages, I think that would become more and more difficult. But in the context of your question, is, is there a place for it in the Canada care paradigm? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Hi, thanks for your talk. Oh, sorry. Mine's not. Mine's dead. I did hear a song. Okay, oh. there we go. Um, just interested in your perspective around the role of primary care as we think of the, the dynamics of individuals and families going in the very early stages. Uh, I think that there needs to be a significant awareness campaign related to primary care about the uh, you know, dementia prevalence statistics um, that we have coming forward and that you know, primary care physicians should be able to um, immediately be able to recognize what constitutes pathological memory changes as compared to normal memory changes and be in a position to make a referral sooner rather than later because if, if the referral is made to a specialized memory care center, then perhaps we can tweak out the dementia journey in such a manner that he has a few more years of being functionally intact and having a good quality of life and also prepare both him and the family for what lies ahead, what to expect and what not to expect and be more realistic in their expectations. So I think primary care has a huge role to play. So how do we go about educating caregivers, both uh, medical professionals and families around these issues? And how do we deal with, I, I would suggest it goes beyond the people um, directly involved in long-term care. For sure. But also, um, these individuals are also prone to get other illnesses as well. And how do you deal with all that? How do we get into the fundamental stages of making that shift that needs to happen at the ground level? Well, I mean, I think that that's the part of the journey we're on at the moment. And certainly um, in the context of our work with the region of Peel, and I'm grateful to the Toronto staff for highlighting that from the media perspective, but we need to now create uh, a circumstance where we make an acknowledgement of the fact that this is the prevalence or this is the problem related to dementia. The current care paradigm, as I've highlighted to you all, is unfit for purpose and there needs to be a concerted move to, to reorientate this to what it needs to be. Uh, but, but I would say that it, it involves a complete um, rehauling of the system. Cool. Conflict of interest, uh, Dr. Saha and I actually know each other very well from the Bolsler <laughs> Health System. 
Uh, I know that in the four years that I've been a manager of the medicine units that I um, work in, it's been very much teaching the staff to change their approach very much and not rush people that are with dementia. The challenge we have is very much education across the board. Families who don't want to admit that their loved one is in, in a bad way. Uh, they don't want them to be sedated, but on the other hand, they don't want them to be tied down. Mm -hmm. But the safety involved for other patients and for the staff, uh, what's interesting and the, for the audience to know that there is hope, uh, love goes a long way. And love of the work, love of the patients, love of what can be taking place. But we absolutely agree the hospital is not the right place right. for these individuals. Uh, the number of patients I have, probably about six to eight out of the 38 census who are there, not because of a medical problem, but because of a social issue, mm -hmm. a failure to cope. And I commend the families that are able to manage in the community to the point of their breaking point. But the placement of these folks is not the hospital for mm -hmm. long-term care. Mm -hmm. uh, but to get the families to accept and to see that hope. And yes, it may cost $7,000 a month to get them to a retirement home. But that's, again, it's so multifaceted. So Perfect. my question for you is, how are we going to keep the mojo going in, in terms of that seamlessness? Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, I, 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 to be perfectly honest with you, I mean, I, I don't contend to have all the answers, but I, I contend to, you know, be here to make the case for the fact that we are not where we need to be and we need to move forward into, into realizing that as a first world developed country that, you know, practices validated evidence-based medical practice. One of the things from what um, I, I, I wanted to say this to you that I forgot to say and I wanted to mention it right now is that one of the aspects that the butterfly model also incorporates is that providing care to dementia patient is not everybody's cup of tea. This is not for everybody. You need to have a certain emotional IQ to be able to do this. And a lot of people who are currently in the care sector do not have that emotional IQ. They are unable to connect at an individual level. And for them, I think it would be you know, sad for those people to be part of this paradigm because they will not be able to get it. So you need to have a certain emotional IQ to be able to do what is required of you to do. To see where I'm coming from. Uh, in the context of the sustenance of this going forward, I mean, I think this is part of it, just to raise awareness in terms of you know, where we are and where we need to be. Thank you very much uh, for your talk. Uh, it was very informative. And when I hear you speak, I'm almost embarrassed because the way that you laid it out, I didn't know that. And it seems so intuitive. And so you know, some of the questions have been about looking forward. But looking back, what is it that has gotten us here? And is it important to know um, by the way that we've been giving care, the kinds of things we can change going forward. If it were any other disease, we know just what to do when our loved one comes home after chemo or mm -hmm. breaking a leg. So what's different here? Well, I think what's different here is that, you know, uh, I, I've read, uh, you know, literature that suggests that the vast majority of what we know about the human brain is that what we've discovered in the past 10 to 15 years. And what we also know for a given fact is that we do not understand why people get dementia in general, and thereby we don't have any effective treatment modalities. So two things, I mean, I, I think the overarching umbrella is that we don't understand what, why people are getting this uh, you know, abnormal protein deposition to get this disease. And again, the statistical evidence coming forward that this is happening in epidemic proportions. Uh, so, and, and that is the conundrum we're in. So we know that we have the problem, but we don't understand the disease. And the more we understand the disease, I'm quite heartened by the fact that uh, I understand I was reading some literature that suggests that there is a global movement from government globally to suggest that having looked at the statistics that w there has been a lot of push and a lot of uh, support to come up with some disease modifying molecule with a target for 2025 because uh, you know there's an acknowledgement that if we don't do something about this this is just going to bankrupt the health service so I think that's the direction that we're moving in from a therapeutic perspective oh, no pressure um, Thank you very much for your talk. I'm interested in your thoughts around what we should be doing and thinking about as a system um, of healthcare providers um, 
about how we can better support um, and provide supports for um, caregivers, care partners, people that are looking um, after and living with individuals with dementia in the community. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned, mentioned that, actually, and again, again uh, raises the, the point I was, I was going to say, but I seem to have clearly forgotten to tell you. So in the context of our interesting journey with this over a year, what we found was a variety of things. Now, as I've highlighted to you, dementia care is not for everybody, point number one. And point number two, that even for the people that it's for, it is extremely taxing from an emotional perspective to provide the level of care on a daily basis to these people. And you, know, you end up with not only physical fatigue, but also emotional slash compassion fatigue. And the levels of sickness in long-term care is actually quite high. But one of the, and I'm, I'll admit to you very frankly that this is not an outcome that I was expecting to see, but with the incorporation of the butterfly model, because it facilitated really connecting with the dementia individuals, um, there was a real sense of purpose with the carers. And you know, they really actually looked forward to coming into work. And sick times went down considerably in, uh, in overall terms. So um, what, we, what we understand is that because of the you know, rolling forward of this care paradigm, antipsychotic usage declined. Because of that, the number of falls declined, sick times declined, overall levels of what I would refer to as, you know, because of the meal status that I've highlighted to you, people were eating better, so nutritional scores rose. So overall, everything seemed to be headed in the right direction. But I mean, in answer to your question, I, I certainly feel that this paradigm, some of those questions get answered um, in better and, you know, um, the carers enjoy what they do a lot more. Uh, other than that, have a great day.